doesn't matter, I think it was uh, at the CUNY Graduate Center. And um, Arthur Dung had made a film in which GAA was quietly put down as being a, a racist organization, which was absolutely not the case. In fact, uh, we tried very hard to be inclusive. And I want to make a statement here. Arthur Dong was an Asian, and I was there in GAA, and I remember we only had like one or two black members, and one of them ended up like running off with part of the ticket, a $2,000 check and disappearing. So it, we tried our best. I mean, we also it, had a committee to bring in people of different sorts. But the middle class, the GAA was really, uh, was really composed mainly. I talk about Silver Rivera still seizing the stage and ran in at these middle class kids who were men, a lot of GAA types. They were all like young college kids and she's saying what are you doing for your brothers and sisters in jail and like most of the people there I remember, and I remember saying I didn't ever know anybody that went to jail and I don't think anyone there did but Sylvia did I just want to inject that yes and uh, but all that time uh, Gay Liberation Front was trying to basically hog the cameras and hog the glory because GA purposely decided to be self-effacing and focus on doing good good works for the community we were working not publicizing ourselves but publicizing the cause right. and uh, I think that history will will change all this I think that there's an awareness now of this and people are writing newer books and making newer documentaries in Arthur Dung's doc documentary he admitted that he um, had a, a bias, that he had a slant about this, and um, I pointed out that GLF had no better track record in drawing people of color or women. Their women split off the way GAA's women split off. You know, they had very few but, blacks. Know, a few women, a few women like Gina O'Leary and also Barbara Giddings particularly, remain, also Renee Cafiero and Mattachine, stood with the men because they were homosexuals first and female or male second. So there was a small minority of women who were very important in keeping peace. I know Matt Foreman at the memorial service for Barbara talking about how Barbara Giddings was the one that says we're homosexual first and male or female second. Yes, she was one of the peacekeepers and Kay Tobin with her. Um, but you just mentioned somebody else, you know. Caffier, she was in Mattachine before your day, and she was on the first picket line for homosexual civil rights. Dino Leary uh, led the group that split off. Let me tell you, I want... Uh, feminist liberation, lesbian feminist liberation. You know, I was talking to Gina Larry as the advocate reporter, and I said, well, girl has to have some legitimacy. What do you call a female 12 years, a 12 years of age or, or, or younger than puberty? Isn't, isn't girl a legitimate description of that? And you know what happened? She hung up on me. I've never had that happen as an advocate reporter my entire life. I have a little bit of humor in this. Uh, Tom Steele, who did a little comic act imitating... Uh, someone on the stage at a gay rally said, would someone please come backstage? There's a four-year-old woman who's lost her parents. <laughs> Well, you know, one of the reasons that there was such a fraction about Sylvia stealing the stage is the lesbians felt that drag queens uh, actually uh, were clowns making fun of women, and therefore they very much objected to trans sites or trans people at that time. They made a difference between uh, street uh, drag queens and transvestites who um, were on stage for pay. And they were arguing about a pair of uh, guys called Billy and Tiffany, um, who appeared on the stage at the 1973 rally in Washington Square Park. And um, it was chaos, absolutely, because uh, Jean came up and read them for filth for deriding the garments that oppress women, while all the women there were dressed in overalls, men's overalls. So it was a kind of bizarre situation. You know, something else that was amazing, if you, they don't show it in the historic document, but when, when Sylvia Rivera took that microphone, she had the base of that microphone. It was like she had a big hammer, and let me tell you, she was ready to knock anybody over that tried to take that microphone back from her. Sylvia was definitely tough. There was no getting around her. But then the head of Queen's Liberation Front, Lee Brewster, uh, got the mic and departed from gay liberation, angry that uh, we let those, and I quote, bitches uh, tell us what to do, and threw his crown, or her crown, uh, into the audience and left. Then came to the next meeting of GAA uh, to ensure that we knew she was leaving. You know, I think it was Lee Brewster who lived her whole life as a woman teacher, and no one knew she was really a male biologically for 50 Harvey, years. I think you're oh, thinking oh, of. Right. Okay, Lee ran a boutique for transvestite 
clothing with size 10 pumps and things like that. Uh, but it was B.B. Scarpy who, to this day, as far as I know, is living as a woman right. and teaching in the uh, city system. I don't want to say where. Right. You, know, you know what was amazing about B.B.'s speech? I remember at City Hall, she gave an impassioned speech about believing in America. It was really a very right wing. I believe in justice. I've always believed that America stood for justice. Here you people are unwilling to give justice to people like us. And it was absolutely, I think, one of the most ringing and moving speeches made. I don't know if you remember down at the first era hearings on City Hall and the gay, uh, gay uh, equality for... Uh, Meanwhile, we were getting people on the other side saying... Is this what your mothers want for you? You know, so it was a very emotionally charged thing. And when they voted no, we turned over all the chairs and ran out and stopped traffic. I remember one vote when it was supposed to pass. We had 27 people. There were only a few of us. I don't remember. It was raining. We stood outside City Hall and we went down there for finally they were going. This was about 1984. It was late. And we finally, they were going to get a city hall bill passed, and it failed because the 27 who swore to the people they were going to vote for it turned on us in the end. We also, what I remember so vividly is standing there in the rain and the people in city hall looking out the window and laughing at us as we got mad. Were you, were you were there in that? No, I was probably, I was at many of them. Um, that may be the year that Arthur Bell kicked uh, Councilman Troy Perry, uh, not Troy Perry, Troy. Uh, I'm bad on names too. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. He was a violent. Michael May is what uh, the firemen's union who was violent, but the councilman was Troy something, Troy Matthews. May his name be erased from history. And you're or, helping in that. <laughs> and Arthur kicked him in the ass on the way down the stairs. You know, so um, we got our little revenge. And in 1986, the whole thing changed anyway. You know, it's funny. I never liked Arthur Evans. I always thought he was kind of crazy, you know, I mean, he just wasn't my kind of person, he was a little too radical for me. But on this wedding bureau tape, when he takes over and that instant anger, the description Mark gives of him being instant anger, and boy, does that instant it wasn't anger... It anger, it was controlled. I know, it was staged, it yeah. was marvelous, it was brilliant, and it was effective. He did it also when we went to disrupt business at the Household Finance Corporation. We ran from uh, one office to another, and we disrupted their business and yelled, um... And Arthur would start yelling, Are you happy that you don't give loans to homosexuals, mister? Come on. And the rest of us would say, Answer the homosexual. Answer the homosexual. <laughs> but you were really one of the great pioneers. I mean, we were following in your footsteps and, and standing on your shoulders, really. No, not really. I had, I, had left, I had left the gay movement for the anti-war movement, the legalized fight movement. I feel I had left, don't get offended, but I say I left the politics of the ghetto behind when my friend's girlfriend almost died from not being able to get an abortion. He gave her a miscarriage with quinine pills and made the parents of her, of the parents of the woman he'd been living with two years over a bed in Bellevue. And at that point, I realized society is not just screwed up about homosexuals. Society is screwed up about sex in general. And from there, it was an anti-war and all these other things. You people took over and made me feel far less guilty because lying up there were very few there and then after you people came along it was just fabulous. It was a new generation with a new approach to things and a new list of demands. I think in the 50... New articulate people. I was the only really articulate person to tell you the truth before GAA and you had and you had a skirgetto. No, Barbara was a very nice very nice, well-spoken, and believe me, she and Kay were my biggest supporters in the movement, in the history, and the fact that I did hold the first gay demonstration, there's a dump wicker thing I have to give you. They now say that Frank Kameny in front of Washington, because I'm too much, you know, I went on to be a human cloning activist, and now I'm putting videos on the internet. I'm now a trans-agent man with a trans woman living with me. You've never met a trans trans-agent man as a young person trapped in an old body. I'm trying to find others. Would you happen to be one? <laughs> Well, I know there's a kid, so I keep a picture of myself as a kid um, sitting on my uh, on my printer right next to my computer. Um, cause I I'm, have my I'm baby picture. Version. I have my, oh good. I have a picture of my unborn twin brother, which is my dream as a cloning activist to leave cells and see he receives a gift of life. But we're getting way of field there. What are you doing now in your writing and, and have you found it satisfying, the books that you wrote? Yes, I did um, a book on uh, my own life and the Gay Activist Alliance. What's that called? Uh, Under the Rainbow, Growing Up Gay. I have that, I have that. And, I'm well, I wouldn't be talking to you if you didn't. I see you have a nice button of Marsha Johnson here. Um, she was a mother, you notice in her heart, she was a mother of my extended gay family. I remember. Um, and I wrote a book on Walt Whitman, and it's sort of a gay biography of Walt Whitman. Um, 
I taught a course in him in college, and I taught a course in uh, what we called sissy lit, gay literature. Jack Nichols was an absolute fanatic about Walt Whitman. I mean, to him, Walt Whitman was everything. I, had, I admired Walt Whitman, but I was not what you'd call. There are people, I'm, don't take it wrong, but there are people that are absolutely fanatics about Walt Whitman. Well, we call them wit maniacs. <laughs> um, I care a lot about him, but I don't think I want to be a fanatic, though his picture is on my wall a lot. Um, and I've done a lot of anthologized essays, uh, and just recently I did an essay about Vito Russo, uh, which is appearing in a new, not a new, but a, a magazine called um, White Crane. Oh, this is so important that this few literary digests carry important history. I have not written for them because I gave up writing. I'm going to start writing my own book and start submitting articles of things that I remember and cover. They seem, you know, very promising to me because it's really substantial stuff. And, um, They've been around for years. They always have the most fans. They were the best. They, them and the Gay and Lesbian Literary Review in, in, uh, out of Massachusetts are the two best publications I know of. They just need to, uh, you know, spread the word a little bit further than they have. And now we have a little more history to share with the world, thanks to Mr. Arnie Kandowitz, a really great author. And remember, he's the one that said first, bald is beautiful. Hair club for men, don't waste your money there. Be bald and be beautiful. I'm getting... <laughs> Uh, well, say, am I, is, am I bald enough to be beautiful? Yes, and your clone will, will have lots of hair, though. <laughs> I, that'd be genetic engineering fine with me. Thank you. Nice talking to you.